So my name's Pia, hi everyone. Um, I've worked for the Senate over the last two and a half years, uh, a bit over, but um, prior to that I had 10 years in the IT industry. I'm one of these sort of typical geeks who manages to walk that fine line between policy and tech. So you know, I've uh, played a very strange role uh, in the Senator's office where I both do all of our um, online strategies, I run our websites, I do all of our um, strategies on social media, I do most of the video editing and all that kind of techy stuff. But um, when I first came to work for the Senator, one of our big goals in working together was to um, try and come up with more ways to make you know, her work as a backbencher senator at that point in time, but also within the context of government, be more engaging, more collaborative, more open, transparent, all these kinds of things. So what we did was we wanted to figure out ways to better use the internet and the various different tools of the internet and the fact that you know, social media was uh, so out there to um, better engage citizens in the process of policy making and development. So what we did was we developed a, a methodology that we called um, Public Sphere, um, based on the Habermas's concept of you know, um, government engaging, or citizens being engaged in the process of how government runs. And um, we, well actually, sorry, I'll take one step back further. We looked at this whole open government space and we sort of thought, okay, there's really three components to it. Um, so we defined what we call the pillars of, of open government, um, which we defined as democratizing data, which is that open data, but also the power of data that we use. Uh, we looked at citizen-centric services, so really, rather than the sort of e-government step, which was taking how we all do stuff in government and putting it online, taking that next step to actually saying, well, a citizen doesn't care which sphere of government or which department their health services come from, they want to put in their postcode and figure out everything that's relevant to them. So how do we actually start to bridge those gaps across government and actually start to deliver services that is wrapped around the unique experience of and, and personal experience of a user in a way that, that actually suits their purposes. So that's what we tried to do. And I'm going to do a very clever thing to be multitasking while I'm speaking. Um, and then the third one's around public engagement, of course. And this isn't just about ticking the box to say, yes, we went and spoke to the stakeholders and, and therefore our, our process you know, meets, um, is compliant to what we're being told to do. It's about genuinely understanding that there is value to be got in the public um, in the general public, in the private sector, uh, that can actually improve policy, improve the delivery and implementation of policy, and actually um, improve the public adoption of and take up of you know, the services of government. Yep, okay. So, um, we, so on that third one in particular, because we've done a bit of work in the other two spheres, but on that third sphere of um, public engagement, we came up with this process that we called public sphere. Um, what we wanted to do was to demonstrate the applied use of the internet and social media tools to actually come up with an outcome. Uh, there are plenty of um, you know, ongoing communication strategies, and you know, you've seen a few in the previous presentation. There are plenty of ways to keep an ongoing discussion going. This isn't what this is about. This is about there is something that needs to be consulted on. Uh, there, there is a, a, you know, a beginning, a middle, and an end to this process, and it is an applied um, use of the tools rather than an ongoing um, open conversation. So, um, just a little bit of background, we've run four of these now within our office, um, which demonstrates that, you know, on the small model we can do this. Um, we used most of the tools from the cloud, uh, so we didn't have to run a lot of our own infrastructure, although we ran some of our own infrastructure. Um, but, you know, particularly as a backbench office, we don't have money, we don't have a lot of resources, so you can do this without, you know, a huge price tag. Um, in terms of statistics, so the, four, the first one was quite small, I think we only had a couple hundred people involved in that one, um, and then they sort of grow. And the most recent one was we did a national consultation with the digital culture landscape, so everyone from games development, uh, film and animation, um, uh, across uh, digital arts, cultural heritage institutions, and media and music. And what we did was we engaged people from <coughs> digital parts of those sectors into a conversation about how a national cultural policy could look from a digital perspective. We collaborated with Minister Crane's office and that feedback actually went into the National Cultural Policy Task Force. Uh, it was a seven week project and in that seven weeks we basically managed to um, run, uh, we, we got about 800 people contributing in some format or another, um, but we also had um, a lot of contributions. Oops, there we go, we are running. We also had a lot of contributions, uh, a lot of other people just watching the process. So I think there were a few thousand people watching, but eight, about 800 <coughs> contributing directly. And of those 800, there were about uh, 30 or 20 contributions that were group contributions, where people went back to their organisations and you know, put a similar sound club. 
So I'm going to get rid of that. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so they, they, we got a, a decent amount of contributions. Now those 800 people contributed about 40,000 words to the wiki, uh, which ended up being pulled together into a um, 53,000 word 108 page paper with almost 200 specific policy ideas across those five um, sectors and um, it was highly valued from the um, task force from the minister's office and it went really well. So those, those are the kind of events that we do. Um, I want to take you through the process of how they run because uh, I thought that might be useful for you because um, we've really tried to come up with a process that has um, integrity, that has transparency, that um, you get something really useful to you know, the work that we all do. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that we actually got an award for this um, the beginning of this year, I think, or the end of last year, from the World Democracy um, Conference in France, where the Senator went and received an award, which is very exciting. Um, but there has also been adoption of this methodology by various universities and departments um, around Australia. And what we're basically saying is, it's a sound methodology, you can use any tool, you can use it for any community, it doesn't have to be a digital community or a tech literate community. It's basically a methodology that we very much have drawn for, from how, from both traditional consultation methodologies and how online, successful online constructive communities work. Um, and so we've sort of tried to, blow, um, to merge that all into a best practice methodology for our usage but also for you. So, how does it work? Those timelines are, you know, very much just sort of guessing it can go for longer or shorter, but we think that a good, uh, to run this process well, you, you need about three months roughly. Um, you, and I mean, that's, as you all would know, that's a relatively short time frame for a government consultation anyway, so you know, you can get a lot done in three months, um, but you can run it longer, uh, and the shortest one we run was over seven weeks, which is the last one. Keeping in mind, of course, that by the end of that seven weeks, I was working 80 hour weeks. But, uh, so yeah, eight weeks is, uh, sorry, um, three months is a little bit better than seven weeks. So the way it works, first of all you've got your design and discovery phase, then you've got your conversations phase, and then you've got your consolidation phase. Now, under the design and discovery, uh, the first step is what's the problem we're trying to solve? You know, there's no point saying we're going to go and have a what do you think the government should do conversation because it will always result in, well, it will very often result in complete and rubbish. Um, Basically, you need to have a, a clear thing that you're trying to solve that people can actually engage in constructively. Um, and it actually helps you set the tone constructively as well. So you find a problem. You come up with a bit of a draft, you know, which is actually a little bit practical. What is it you're trying to solve? What sort of you know, um, input that we think people are going to have? Um, and then you go and you do the next stage. Ooh, I think I just skipped a stage. Um, this is the most important stage. Community development. Now, how many people here in the comms communications team in their agencies or departments? A bunch of you. Um, of the rest of you, well, actually, how many people here are technical in some form? I don't know. About the other half of the room. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> basically, what we found is, um, and this is the observation I've made across a, a bunch of different things, but generally, how government defines how it engages with the public is through the medium of traditional media. So you basically go to your media development person, your media advisor, and then they come up with a strategy to actually uh, maximise the effect of going to the traditional media. Now, we actually have the mechanism now to talk directly to people. It's called the internet. Um, you may have heard of it. Um, there, and the way that you deal with actual people is very differently than how you deal with traditional media. If you go to actual people with the sort of sound bites that would work with traditional media, because you know they, they don't have a lot of time, you need to be able to get them to report as much as you possibly can, so you have to break things down very, very, you know, strongly, um, it doesn't work. That's not how normal people talk. So um, what you need to make this stuff work is a, a new skill set that works in collaboration with your comms team, but also in collaboration with your tech team as well, I think, um, which is all about community engagement, community development. Um, you will all have people, you know, in fact, probably most of you already are these sort of people that have some of these skills intuitively, but um, it's about how to engage people directly and you know the examples like Queensland Police, it's about engaging people directly. Um, and, and realizing that not only is limiting yourself to going through the traditional media um, a risk, um, but it, um, it it doesn't get to necessarily the people in the in the format and in the messaging that you want it to get through. But um, it also is reliant upon um, you know their goodwill. 
Whereas, as you saw with Queensland Police, the local paper was misreporting things and they managed to get on top of that and, and correct that misinformation before it actually got to the general public en masse. Um, but the other part of this, so the first part is the community development skills. The second part is, um, this is the stage where you research, right? So you say, hey, who are the traditional stakeholders that we already know in this space, in whatever the space is, it could be farming, it could be tech, it could be, um, you know, it, it could be anything. Um, then you start to go online and do a bit of research or through you know, whatever mechanism is best and say, okay, well, who are the loud people, the loud organisations in this space? Who are the thought leaders? Who are the people that have access to and, and can be basically vectors to access spheres of communities? So you say, okay, well, that person writes a blog which is you know, read by a lot, a lot of people. They're going to be a good thought leader to actually pull into the tent. None of this is launched yet, by the way. This is all the background information you're doing before you take this thing public. So you go out and you find um, who stakeholders, who are the thought leaders out there and the thought leader organisations. <coughs> and finally, and this one's often overlooked, who are the people who are going to be affected by this policy? Now, there's a really good example. There's, um, sometimes consultation isn't just asking people what they think. Uh, sometimes it's also about um, observing what people do. I'll give you an example. Um, there was a, a case in the university, I can't remember where it was, but um, they did um, this big consultation about where they should put the pathways in the university to make it you know, as accessible to everyone. They got you know, 50,000 stories from 50,000 people. Um, so what they did was the, the dean just went, okay, bugger this, um, and he put grass everywhere, right? And he left it there for a year. And then as the students walked from class to class, of course, the, the pathways started to actually be, um, to be made obvious. The grass would die where everyone was walking. So over a year, they actually had, um, not through asking people where they actually walked, but through actually observing where people walk, they actually figured out what the most optimal places to put paths were. So sometimes consultation is not you know, just about saying to people what do you think you need, but actually seeing what they do. Um, so we do that kind of research as well. What are ways that we can identify information which is going to help us do this? So community development, really, really important. After you've defined who they are, you go and you talk to some of these thought leaders and talk to some of the stakeholders. Um, it's probably not the point at which you go and engage with you know, everyone but it's the point where you go and engage with uh, the people who are going to A, help you design your, your consultation such that the language and that the approach is suited to the communities that you're trying to get engaged, right? Uh, a good example to that is the last um, consultation we did around digital culture, of course, one of those stakeholder groups was the cultural heritage sector. Now you go and you say to anyone in the cultural heritage sector, so we're looking at talking to cultural heritage, and they say, well, what do you mean? And you say, well, you know, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. They go, oh, well, that's all right then. <laughs> So we have to be explicit to say galleries, libraries, archives, museums because there's been in the past sensitivities about sometimes when people say cultural heritage they just mean archives or they just mean libraries or they just mean museums. So there was a lot of sector you know, um, sensitivity about that so we had to be very explicit in our language and only through talking to stakeholders ahead of launching it you can do that. Because once you launch this thing, you know, people's first impression of it is going to define how they engage with it. So you want to get the language as correct as possible, you want to get the tone as correct as possible and you want to have as many thought leaders on board as possible before you launch, so that when you launch, you know, it already has them behind it. Okay, so then you launch. Uh, in our case, um, the consultation, because the consultations we've done have mostly been digital, digitally engaged communities. Um, I mean, our first one was on high-speed bandwidth, our second one was on Gov 2.0, ironically enough, which is still one of the best papers and resources you'll find on Gov 2.0, so I highly recommend you go and check out the Gov 2.0 public sphere paper. Um, it's a, about a year and a half old now, but it's still quite useful. Um, and then we did the third one on ICT and creative industry development, and then we did the fourth one on, fourth one on <coughs> culture. Um, but we've also worked with universities and, and um, departments to run some other ones as well, but mostly digitally engaged. So the tools that we've used have been um, the blog as the central place to sort of pull everything together. We've used Twitter, we've used Facebook, we've used SlideShare, Livestream. We've used a whole bunch of tools that, that were catered to the communities that we dealt with. But I mean, for instance, if you want to do a consultation with uh, a community which you may not think to be traditionally engaged online, you could say, okay, well, there's a yearly conference that pulls you know, all the thought leaders in that space together, or maybe there's a particular um, mailing list, or maybe there's a, a particular paper newsletter that's sent out, or, you know, you figure out where, I mean, in Gungahlin is a really good example where if you want to do a consultation in Gungahlin, there's the Gungahlin Gunsmoke, you know, independently run magazine, which goes to everyone in Gungahlin. So if you want to do anything in Gungahlin, that's a really good locally run thing that you can get out to you know, a lot of people there. So it's, again, go back to that research.